Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57-page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world-class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, We also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership, It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now, my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White, or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader, and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult, and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to episode 19 of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Peter Richardson. Peter is the founder and group CEO of 365 Assistance, and he's worked in the international assistance industry for more than 18 years and brings experience in collaborations and avant-garde brains trust mindset. Fast becoming recognized as one of the IA industry experts, Peter continues to work closely with connections across a number of regions. 
For him, the key to the customer value proposition is to listen, understand the goals, build solutions that enhance products in a supportive uh, platform, improving the client's branding proposition. With a background in insurance, Peter worked across personal commercial lines of business, accident, health, motor lines, property, liability, and CTP in both underwriting, claims management, and executive leadership. In 2002, Peter joined International SOS with his remit to identify opportunities, build relationships, engineer new product lines, acquire high-performing staff to build on the success of membership, financial institutions, loyalty groups within the Australasian region. National Roadside Assistance that remains successful established within this organization with brands like Ferrari, Maserati, Citroen, Fiat, Subaru, Volkswagen, Suncorp, Real Insurance, and Industry Key Alliance. Peter saw opportunities and the need for investment and now carries this experience into 365 Roadside Assistance. In 2006, Peter worked in the Asia region and was tasked to drive innovations and partnerships both in products with groups like Visa International, AIG, VGA, and many other global. And many other global. Peter's expertise and passion for expertise and passion for permeates through the essence of the 365, 365 Assist 365 Group. Assist uh, Peter, group. thank you so much for coming uh, on the Peter, podcast so and welcome. On the podcast and welcome. Thank you, Jono. It's nice to be here. So firstly, for our listeners, tell us a little bit about your role as founder and group CEO and uh, about the 365, uh, 365 Assistance Group. Yes, certainly. 365 uh, was founded on the premise that we felt that uh, there was a, a significant opportunity for a partnership-driven um, central uh, assistance group to coordinate and work with, you know, core partners across across the financial services, OEMs, fleet, and um, uh, insurance space, um, and through that uh, and through that uh, alignment, saw significant opportunity where others may not have, invariably at a partnership in a digital alignment level. So 365 has has morphed and built a very strong reputation amongst the industry as a very much a, a thought leadership group, but also a, a, a centralised, well-structured, reliable, integral partner to groups you know, now like Toyota and many others, where our role is to look beyond the solution the problem and and look at solutions with their groups and their stakeholders and build alignment understanding and a passion for their brands and that's continues to take us and uh, my many wonderful uh, stakeholders and and staff on on a journey on a day-to-day basis 365 is uh, uh, ostensibly a as i said assistance company our role is building partnerships with OEMs, but also insurance companies and fleets and membership support groups. And we've introduced organize, to organisations solutions around having a level of transparency on what their customers do, but also being very much the Uber of roadside assistance, but, deli- but designing the solutions almost like we're the Atlassian for the automotive industry. So very much recognizing the role we play the strengths of our organization and bringing the 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 people within um within the industry who i see as experts in the industry into 365 to really continue to deliver on a a, a, what a what a um i see is a a very very bright future for the group yeah fantastic thank you for giving a bit of uh, a a little bit of an outline of uh, of the 365 assistance group so tell us about your story i'm interested to know specifically as you look back the mo- and you can go as far back as you want <laughs> you can go back to childhood if you want uh, but what are some of the moments that really shaped peter richardson becoming the leader you are today and that's that's a, a an interesting question uh Jono, because i um i don't have a uh, educated background in terms of pure management skills i've had to learn on the job um, a contextual learning, if you like, and sure. that's um, and, and and that's certainly something that um, that you know uh, is is a continual learning pattern. But I would have to say 
the story for me really starts as it may do for many as a, as a young as a young boy. My mother uh, was a was a um, uh, an advocate for a, for choice theory, and that's all about empowering children to make decisions and own the outcomes. And this was embraced by the education department um, broadly. And for her work, she won a prime ministerial award. award then they established a great, and that established a great reference point for me as an individual through my career using such tools as that. And they also, be, and it, I suppose it was in, in it was ingrained in in terms of my leadership DNA from a very early uh, very early um, point on. She, um, I, I do remember the first time she was had learnt this choice theory and it's all about providing and empowering people as I said to make choices and to own the outcomes that they have so as a as a child in a classroom um, you get the choice to learn or not and she would drive that um, that story where children would fundamentally change parents would change and teachers would change and it became such an engaging and um, encompassing way of of teaching that it really did change a lot of outcomes and, and as I said she was rewarded very highly but the first time she was doing it she practiced on us and so I remember sitting in the kitchen probably eating cornflakes over a uh, over the kitchen bench and and there was some problem and instead of actually coming up with a solution she asked another question and then she continued to ask questions and then would ask things like so what do you think about that and how do you feel that we could get a better outcome is there another way of looking at it and I looked at her and shook my head and said, "Mum, your your school stuff's not going to work on me." And got up and walked away. And walked away. But I but I do recall that um, from that moment on, I could see how passionate she was, and maybe that started to rub off, because I, I think it's, you know, I think it's, it was a powerful learning curve, uh, and achieving achieving the results required for the roles that I've covered in more recent years, I reflect on that style and, and probably align my style to my present day um, approach, which meant, you know, and, and which meant um, overcoming cultural barriers, physical distance, there's language nuances, changes and role classifications with all the different egos and we all measure success differently. But as long as, as long as you're engaging, the, you're in the moment and you mm. and you drive and you, and you, you, you build people into um, almost like visionary disciples. And I use that term often to my own staff. Um, let's mm. find as many uh, vision disciples as we can to share our vision and our dream and, and bring them along for the journey. And that includes everyone in, in within our staff. So it almost acts like a, a shared goal or a glue, if you like. In, and, um, and that approach I learned at a very, very early age. Yeah, I, that makes perfect sense to me as to why that would be so such a powerful approach in leadership because I, I definitely reflect for myself, one of my biggest challenges as a leader has been to realize that mu so much of leadership is in the questions and in the listening rather than in, uh, in what you're saying. And I, I can hear how that was modeled to you at a, at a young age from, from your mum. Yeah, I would, I would, John. I would absolutely agree. I think being a good listener uh, is not just necessarily about not saying something. Too, it's all, sometimes if you're in the moment and you're with a person, it's about how they feel you're connecting with them. Um, yes. And um, and by by and I think that's brought about new challenges in in more recent times, as we as a as a as a, as a as a culture, I'm going to say a global culture, because really we have, I have employees in a number of different countries now who really feel just as much a part of the team because we're sitting on Zoom as often as we are than, than someone in the neighbouring suburb. And by, by, you know, the, by helping and asking questions and saying, join me, let's achieve this together and making sure that you respond positively, you, comment, you, com you compliment them, and you reinforce that positive momentum. But at the same time, if if you're not sure or you don't feel the direction's going the way that you originally planned, you can often overcome that challenge by asking questions and asking how they arrived at that response. And often it's if you're particularly if you're in a in a in a in a comms meeting or you're with a number of other staff or even or even colleagues, if you're in a in a more of a junior management position. You know, together you often find the right outcomes, and I think it's that 
the, the, the small subtle, it's not one single word or one, or one approach. It's a, it has to be a multitude of a number of different things combined together and if you're genuine about it, you get a much better result than, and people can see it and they can, they know if you're in the moment. And uh, I, mm. I guess it's just being genuine and real about the approach. And I think that's, that's really a, 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 a you know, a, something that I've always found in other managers I could pick. So I really wanted to learn and be that manager myself. Yeah, that's something that recently has been a reminder for me is that some of those statistics about how much of communication is in your body language. I can't remember what the exact numbers are, but they're so high. Uh, you know, it's like, um, is it 10% that's, that's verbal or is, it's so low. And, and I wonder, it did make me think about things like zoom, uh, or even yes, say, you know, yes. for this podcast right now, we're doing this audio audio only. And you think, well, uh, what does that, what does that mean? How have you found working and having staff overseas? What, what tips uh, would you give to others around communicating I think communicating over Zoom when you're not in the room together is such a relevant question. I know whenever I hear anyone talk about it, I lean in to go, what can I learn? Because it's uh, it's new territory. What what thoughts do you have on that, Peter? Yeah, look, the, the number of jokes and, and, and mishaps and, uh, and, and commentary from listening to others around uh, fails or, or funny moments that have happened over Zoom in this past 18 months of... <laughs> I've no doubt you you would have just as many versions or stories as I do, but I think the I, and and I think that um, I think that human frailty is is not a bad thing. I think that showing weakness and showing vulnerability is not a bad thing, um, as long as you're in, you you hold your integrity high. Uh, that is that is key. And and why, where I'm going with that is that. Often with Zoom, you miss those, and you talked about, um, and I think it's a very good topic. You talked about body language and the art of body language in in really being in the moment and doing the best job you can of communicating and, and letting your team give them the success moderators and allow them to be successful. You, it, it's some people do much better than others at it, and that ha- is hard to bring across the Zoom. But I think. There are av- avenues and success stories um, to be had there, and I think it's often around frequency, familiarity, um, accepting that if you're going to be on Zoom, that you're looking at the camera as much as you can, so trying to build and drive eye contact, trying to be in the moment in Zoom to those people, but also owing them the respect and hearing what they have to say, and being... Um, you know, being a good listener on Zoom is not too different from being in the room with them. However, you just need to recognise, I think, that um, that often, you know, people people can feel a little bit disconnected. Is and by making by making um, uh, by bringing a human frailty side or a, or a or a genuine side and and uh, into a Zoom meeting is probably about showing a little bit about yourself on a one on one. I'm talking about on a one on one level. Yeah. The, the complexity comes when you start dealing with 30 or 40 people on Zoom in a, in a, in a conference and or a communications meeting. But that isn't in itself. That's not management. That's not leadership. Well, it's probably leadership in some ways. But your communication style and your approach is very different. And I think, you know, we're, you and I are talking about the one on one. Yes. And that and that really then comes back to the human aspects and conveying that to people over Zoom. I think you can do that by sharing a little bit about yourself, showing that you, you know, you you, you have a you have a soft side and and a, um, a you're genuine. You have the integrity. You're genuinely interested in the conversation. You're not anywhere else. You're looking at the you're looking at the um, at the at the camera and or them. And you, if they ask a question or, or whatever, you're responding. You know to that question and, and even showing that you're considering what they've said and, and trying to respond to that. So I, they're things that I'm very focused on, rightly or wrongly. I'm sure that I'm making, I do make many mistakes, but I think as you're genuinely trying to involve people, uh, it, it, you do go a long way. And I, our people feel we have uh, you know, in Philippines, Singapore, and um, even Fiji and New Zealand, and they're all um, they're all as much as part of the team and we have jokes and uh, get them to be involved in day-to-day things just as much as anyone in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I like what you said there. I guess to uh, to sum up some of the things you th- said there, it sounds like intentionality 
some of the things that we take for granted when you're in the room, which is there's no cameras in between you. So you're just, uh, if you're not present, it's more obvious, right? You, and if you have emotional yes. intelligence, you're going to feel, uh, it, it's easy to feel awkward and go, oh, I really should be in this moment more. Whereas I think sometimes over over Zoom, you need to you need to be more intentional about that because it's easier to focus on that less and being present and communicating that you that you're in the moment I think takes more intentionality but what I like about what you said is is it's really the same things as being in the room you just need to be more intentional about them and uh, and and tweak how you do them but it's the same ideas and I want yeah it absolutely is and I think we all have to recognize that it at some point, it's a skill that every single manager who is able, who enables people to work from home is going to have to consider about the approach because it's something that I don't think we're going to see go away very quickly given that the, 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 skills, the skill shortages uh, and finding good people is so difficult to get that you really want to embrace them in every way possible. And I think it's, uh, you know, being pivotal and accepting that zoom is a part of our life and or you know who, who knows where it'll go but um it's it's a part of our life and we've got to get better at it yeah i agree uh, so if we go back to to your story what are what are some other moments that you reflect on uh as a young leader or in more recent years where you you think yeah, that really, that was a pivotal moment. You know, those moments that you you think back to and you think, wow, I remember seeing how that leader dealt with that or I remember when I dropped the ball there, but that was such a learning curve for me. You know, what, what are some other moments that really shaped you becoming who you are today, Peter? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, okay. I think it's... It's a, it's a look. It's a, it's an interesting question. I have had, um, I've had moments where I had a young. He was young then. He's not young now, which is probably <laughs> giving a little bit of a secret uh, away of my age. But um, <laughs> no, I'm still very young. <laughs> yeah, um, right. The, the reality is, is I was walking through the city one day, and I, and I was stopped and said, "Hey, Pete." I turned around, and I'll leave the person's name out of it, but. I said, oh, hello, and we started talking, and it wasn't long into the conversation before he turned around, and I'd complimented him on his new role, which is a very senior role at a new, a large international insurance company, and he said, I still look back as the time when you managed me is the most inspirational, and I've never forgotten it, and it's stood the test of time, and I look back at, on it so fondly, and I'd said to him, thanks, his name. And I, as I, and we, there was other small talk, but I walked away and I, and I thought about that for days after. In fact, I'm still thinking about it and it's been nearly 12 months. And what makes, what has made such an indelible impression on his, on him? And then I reflect on perhaps some of my early period uh, uh, in, in working in different insurance companies where the emotional quotient of the leader was, I'm going to say somewhat poor. But yeah. their intelligence, in a legal sense, um, uh, and and others, and a, a, an academic sense, was was certainly. Um, well, she had the, the the right degrees, and but she she really struggled to manage people and communicate, and and had a, a genuine disconnect. And I, at that time, remember that I never want to be that person, and, and no matter how much respect you had for her and her role, I never wanted to be that person. And I and I suppose that. The, that positive and then negative influence has has really started to shape me in the sense of what I do want and what I don't want. And then I refer to I can bring on to to more to more even more recent times working in Asia. I was very fortunate to work with, in fact, nearly every, in fact every manager I had whilst I was uh, with International SOS. Uh, I, I really were was inspired by them because of their capacity to wear many hats deal yes. with a, a multitude of situations, cultural situations, uh, managed by influence, which is a very challenging thing uh, to do. And I'll go into how that shaped me in a minute. But these people were had um, had difficult 
roles because of the 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 gap and the and the the distance between their um, their many reports. They had a varying number of administrative and functional reports, and then they had to manage by influence and watching and how they how they they shaped and and design conversation and narrative around points to get the to to achieve the outcome they were looking to do i could see that almost architecturally in front of me happening and watching the narrative sort of blow by blow and then the outcome uh, was often favorable and i i actually thought with writing notes and i still have that little book today it still sits now within three feet of me um, just in terms of the dot points about their approach and um, this lady, uh, and I'm happy to name her, was May Tam. She was just phenomenal. Um, still is a dear friend. I respect her greatly. But then there was, uh, you know, I had another guy, um, Tan Nui Wat, who, who was who was a, the president up in Asia, and just his personable nature, yet his ability to to um, to to um, deal across all levels and provide still a human face to it all it was just remarkable through the process. And I felt. These are the two people that I really wanted to shape a, 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 a style of management on. So yes. I went on then to uh, look at uh, working across uh, well, Asia, but particularly North Asia. And I'd, I'd be often in Hong Kong uh, and Singapore, but particularly Korea and all parts of China. And there was my role was really to, as a part of the regional team, was to, to influence and to whilst manage, but also influence outcomes and drive and drive results on uh, with 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 staff who weren't my direct reports, and to do that, it's that that I felt was probably the 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 that was pand the Pandora's box for me of management styles because it taught you that there are so many different stories and people with varying backgrounds who all respond to different. Um, uh, different types of um, management styles and leadership styles, and they and and visionaries, but they um, they were often they were often you know and we we had language barriers and we had the the tyranny of distance and time zones, but they were often um, very motivated and very and very and very uh, uh, obliging when you when you would work with them, and yeah. you know that that just built suddenly a passion. So I. I started to become quite, uh, I would say, okay at influencing people until we come now into the, the more recent times where I have a very, very strong focus and passion on what I do. I love, we love what we, we are and what we represent uh, at 365 and we believe that we really do um, have um, a lot of opportunity to to make a real significant difference in the markets that we operate and so by bringing people in who I see as much more talented and, in, and inspirational than I've ever been in terms of uh, in terms of what they're able to deliver I, I just love opening the scope up and watching them really go for go for goal and it's and so I think that's all of my previous experiences have really taught me that if people believe and I'm genuine about the vision I have, they will follow. If they too can feel a part and can be embraced and feel and feel you know uh, encompassed in the world that um, uh, that uh, of all things three six five, but also that they feel that they um, you know they're accountable, they have ownership, you know that, that there are structures around around the, the support that we give and that we manage. We we support good performance. We 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 ask for their input. Um, and and suddenly suddenly you find yourself following all of the cliched management styles, but it but you but it seems to work. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's where I am today. And I don't have there's no science behind that, John. O. it's simply just uh, I suppose the contextual learning of being in the industry for a long time and 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 having a passion. Yeah, that's right. Well, it is the uh, I, I would I would argue there is there is science in it. It's the science of um, real time feedback <laughs> and uh, and data because I, I guess it's uh, it's not um, it's not necessarily measured in uh, you know measured in a book. But for you, you're you're uh, that's what I love about leadership is every day is an experiment, and uh, we all look back and think, wow. That hypothesis really failed ten years ago when I did that, and I, <laughs> I learned and I got overwhelming data 
poured on me by that person uh, feeling so misunderstood and upset, etc. And uh, and so yeah, it's uh, but like you said, it's it's contextual learning. And um, when you talk about yeah. managing influence, I, I love that you went there and I uh, unpack managing with influence and what you saw, particularly with those those real mentors that you've modeled your leadership off that you mentioned. How yeah. how did they do that? What what does managing uh, through influence look like? So there is um, you 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 have to have a high level of communication. You have to have a a central theme or a target or a very well established um, process in which um, communications run, but equally a a well understood um, well understood vision and. Uh, strategy in terms of where is the united front where is the collective where are we going how are we going to do this so by 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 building a uh, managing influence style it is really making sure that everybody within the influence structure understands what the common goal is and what 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 success looks like and success for people looks very different because some people don't they they see what it where you're going, but for them that doesn't make re- it's not relevant. So you have to contextualize it or make that relevant for them. And once you understand what's relevant for them, and then you align, you know, the strategy that it, that is the strategy. But you can you can verbalize it, um, have a discussion around the varying topics to get to the same end goal, and then they buy into it, they understand it, and they feel a part of the the vision, and they want to embrace it in their day to day work. Then it's about frequency of connection, communication, and then saying and questioning how we can then be both collectively accountable. Don't walk, I think managing by influence isn't walking away and saying, okay, you need to do that. Let's, let's check in next week and see where you're up to. It's about how can we do this together? Well, if you do that bit, I will do this. And then together we can then move to the next step. And they then feel a part of it. They feel that they're not alone and they've always got someone to, to build a, a working sort of association or friendship with. So I think that's that's a key and that was a key and that's what they did. Yes, you could understand that there were disciplines and there was, um, well, there was management processes, but there was also firm leadership in terms of providing the direction and, 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 uh, and, and providing a platform for people to be successful. But there was also... And, and there was a genuine respect because I think in, in particularly in Asian cultures, the level that the way leadership and or management is viewed internally is a little bit different to some other Western groups, society. So it's a, it is different in Asia as it is in Europe, as it is in the States, as it is here. So you have to look at the cultural diversity and 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 use and make sure that you're you know you're looking at there's always challenges around that so language you've got um gender racial religious um location and and uh, as long as you you can you you're recognizing that and you're removing that as a is any impediment uh, off, uh, that's how it worked and they did it to the point that uh they could get excited when when people some would achieve sometimes the smallest things, but those small things uh, were were, con- were were a consequence of something else that happened, and as and and were able to sort of build a journey cycle or a, or almost animate, if you like, a process that everybody felt that they'd contributed to it, and by that you've just united everyone as a team, and it was they were so good at it that they weren't even trying in the end. And, and and for me, that's what I pulled. And that's what I now call vision disciples, where, um, again, you know, people who are so so passionate about the end vision becomes the disciples to it. Yeah, I, I really like that idea, vision disciples. I think it's, uh, I think it's great because you have to, uh, you know, Patrick Lencioni says if you want people to buy in, they have to be able to weigh in. And I think that's... Uh, that's sort of the starting point is you have to find a way to uh, to do the journey together, like you're saying. And Mark Glitzerwhite, who was uh, on episode two, who is a uh, the president of a group of uh, chartered schools in the US, he talks about this idea of being the guide yeah. from the side. And I love that as well. There's, okay. there's something about together yeah. that's supporting, bringing people into it. If you were, I, I love to ask this hard question. This is the, this is the, uh, 
uh, the coaching part of me that can't help but always be narrowing things down and helping. <laughs> so apologies in advance, uh, Peter, for this That's question. Right. But if you were sitting with a leader and they said to you, Peter, help me help me learn how to do this vision disciples. How do I, how do I raise, how, how do I, how do I start actually implementing this? And you could only give them one thing to do, one tool, one idea, one, you know, one step to take, what would be sort of, and you can pick two if you want, you know, I, I like to be a little bit uh, generous. <laughs> I bet uh, so you narrow it down very well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So you can have two if you want. Someone the other day listed off about five at this point when I asked a similar question. So you know what, I'm, I'm pretty generous. Um, but if you had to really narrow Thank it down and, and pick the most, like just just a, a couple of things for them to go and do to be able to start implementing that and, and building vision disciples, what would you say to them? I would, uh, this is, Vision Disciples is about really, um, for me, and the advice I would be, would be, I would give, would be to have a, a vi the, the, the idea of vision casting. And, and I know that you've mentioned this um, uh, previously in, uh, in, in some of the podcasts and, and the work you've done, but it's about being able to have a discussion with people and not talk at people, have a discussion with people. So in other words, engage, sit down, engage the person you're discussing with and share them with them the vision you have and why. And if a person can buy into why for them, in other words, they understand what, not the, the WIFM principle, that's a little bit of a cliche, but they, they get your why. Why is this important and how is it going to make a difference? If they understand that from your perspective, and then you're sharing a plan, but you're doing it in that almost in a in a, a question and answer and a and a, and a conversational sense. Um, I think you're effectively aligning a vision, or you're sharing a vision, and then you're building a you're building engagement with the person you're you're talking with. They will soon learn to trust what you're saying, and it's with trust, it's with integrity. And it and I, and, I'm, and integrity, I think, is a, a, a very very important thing in this. Um, it's a then they start to re, they start to accept that, um, yeah, that's that's something I can I can see would work for me. And then it's again back to right back to year 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 six at school. It comes back to you know the the, the information I talked to you about in the original sense about choice theory, asking yeah. questions about letting them have the letting your people make choices that impact them and them owning the choices they make. And if they yes. buy into the they buy into the vision and they're making choices because you're allowing them to make choices by asking and reverting into questions and empowering them to make those, that is where you get the best outcomes. That's where I've got the best outcomes uh, and they buy into that the, they will buy into the story simply because they feel absolutely a part of it. So that would that, I know that's more but it's I suppose it's one theme, Jono. Yeah, you can. I'll let you get away with that. It's uh, it was very uh... <laughs> just this once. <laughs> That's right. That's really good. I love, I love uh, the idea of why. You know, I find it really hard though, and I feel like it's such it's it's something we probably need to come back to almost every day because it's there's an element of explaining the why behind something that sometimes feels a bit unnatural. We feel like we're repeating ourselves. Uh, it doesn't feel like it's the most necessary information. That's my experience anyway. It's probably something I drop much, it's much easier to drop that than it is to explain the how or the what when you're communicating uh, anything. Do you have any tips around articulating the why? Actually, you... Tono, I, yeah. I just say um, I, I do, um, I'm part of the leadership think tank. It's a, it's a group in Sydney with other CEOs and founders and and. And we often we're often spoken to by different uh, different groups, and mm. I, rem I I can recall a presenter sharing some information on a military. Uh, it's a coffee company in the US that only sold to military personnel. Are you familiar with them? No, no, I'm not. I can't I'm recall. I can't recall the name, and and because I'm you're taking me down this line, I'm unprepared. I would ordinarily maybe have the name of the company and the person, but their their success story was they they came back as serving armed professionals, serving part of the armed forces out of the US, they came back and they said, you know what, we we want to start a coffee company, but we're going to sell coffee to veterans uh, who have 
and they started uh, brewing coffee and sending it to veterans and it became very popular and more and more people were saying send more send more to the point they then set up and uh, they grew to now they're, they're turning over over 100 million dollars us and they have a very simple catchphrase and catch cry um, and they keep coming and and, and building uh, and, and and talking about the same thing which is you know we sell coffee uh, and, and there were some other specifics around it, but it was very, very simple. And people bought into it because it was so easy to understand as to why and what they were doing. And often yeah. we make things more complicated than they need to be. So the why I think is important. Why are we doing this? Because we want to make good coffee and give it to extra veterans. Why are we doing what we're doing at 365? Because we see that the, the digitally connecting with clients and, and working with our partners to solve those solutions is going to make a massive difference in their customers' lives. And why, Jono, do you do what you do? It's I think it's something we just have to we just have to continually reflect on and and, and because it will build more interest in what you do and, and take more people along for the journey. That's certainly my experience. Yeah, I agree. Is that is it Black Rifle Cop, uh, Coffee Company? It is. is. That, Thank yes. you, sir. It no, is. that's right. I yes. thought I'd do a, a sneaky uh bit of googling on my on my phone just so that anyone listening uh look up black rifle cop uh coffee company and uh and you can read about them and what a great example uh no i haven't heard of them but i'm definitely going to to look into that so thank you for that peter uh and i think you're right it's simple isn't it it's uh and so much of leadership is uh, you said it before really well about uh yeah you know when i reflect some of these are the management and leadership cliches uh, but they're cliches, sometimes cliches are bad, you know, in, in general, but in leadership, I often find that they're, they're cliches because they're true. Something that you reminded me of early on when you talked about that story from 12 months ago, how someone said, hey, I just want to say thank you so much for, for leading me, is um, for the way you led me, you know, that's, I, I think of John Maxwell and I think of Jim Collins and these authors who talk about uh, different, you know, levels of leadership and how it's always about the people you invest in. And I love how that story was yes. just a living example of that. What what came to your mind when I asked you about something significant? It was someone you led turning around and saying, thank you for how you led me. That's made a difference in my life. And now I'm modeling how I'm leading in this role um, off, off that I experience. I think um, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense, Jono. And it sort of reminds me, and I think everyone should have that, that when you say, what are you most passionate about as a leader? Mm. Um, and seeing the success of people and their accomplishment and, 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 and feeling a part of that, allowing them to find their sweet spot of happiness and, and, and delivering, I know it's cliche, but I, I'm a firm believer, purpose, purpose, purpose. They, they need, yeah. they find their purpose and you by shaping that, it, it, you do feel warm and, 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 and blessed really perhaps to have been, had the opportunity to, um, to have a role to play in that. And uh, so often as a leader, we, we tend to probably forget our, our, our small good moments and we focus on the things that are most challenging. But it's often important to reflect on why and, the, and some of the positive attributes that you have and, and some of those that, you know, that, 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 that have such an influence on the people around you. Yeah, I think you've you've yeah. said that really well, and that's a great place to, uh, I guess, to start wrapping up. I I asked before off uh, before we started recording, but I would love to, uh, you know, potentially do a second round down the track, and and there's so much more I want to chat with you about uh, that's come up from this conversation. Uh, that you know, the casting vision, I've uh, I've had to hold myself back because I'm so passionate about that topic. So there's lots more we can explore, but we can we can do that another time. As we as we wrap up now, did you have any final thoughts uh, for listeners? Other than other than uh, be be uh, genuine, be in the moment, and don't be afraid to be um, vulnerable and passionate about what you truly believe in, because you will achieve more in those moments than you will in any uh in any sort of contextual uh you know um management meeting or by often taking different lines i think you can say things very simply very genuinely very directly uh to people and um as long as you're you know you're, you're building those connections uh and and you're you're holding true to yourself i think you really it's, it'll be difficult for you to fail as a leader if you if you if you if you're passionate and and genuine about um, and 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 supportive and caring about your approach, 
Yeah, well said. Uh, well said, Peter. And thank you to our listeners. Appreciate you tuning in. I know once again, uh, I am so confident. I love conversations like today because I know listeners uh, will have gotten something out there. And I know there'll be a lot of leaders out there scratching their heads going, hmm, how can I include more of the why and more of the purpose in my next conversations with my people and with stakeholders? So thank you to our listeners and uh, a thank you again to Peter. Thank you, Peter, for being so generous with your time. And uh, thank you for sharing your advice and, and really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Jono, it's been a pleasure until next time. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this, I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O. White, or clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in Step Up or Step Out 
And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.